I didn't get an update for the last uh, couple of days. So uh, actually, I'm sorry to say that the family uh, did have to make a decision for uh, Mr. Bowen. And he actually uh, was, uh, he passed away Thursday evening. And uh, that doesn't mean to say that we don't pray for uh, the extended family who were suffering that loss. I, sorry if I miss, I did mislead you. I thought he was still hanging on. Uh, having uh, been involved in uh, weddings and funerals for the extended family and spent uh, quite some time with a uh, number of other in the family, uh, I just uh, thought I would share that with you. Anyway, setting that aside, uh, Christians uh, come with labels. Uh, by that I mean uh, there are traditional labels like Protestant, Catholic. We are familiar with those for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, there was a time when all Christians uh, universally were called universal Christians, universal or Catholic. And then, of course, uh, one very famous king in England decided that we'll uh, start a different branch of this thing. And he called it uh, those, we, he sprang from those who protested. So uh, that gave uh, rise to quite a few national churches and other movements that were all protesting or Protestants. Uh, fundamentalist is another uh, label. I might think of myself as a fundamentalist uh, in as, as much as that uh, involves adhering to fundamentals. Uh, unfortunately, it then uh, becomes associated with, and quite rightly so in some cases, uh, the strict belief that uh, leads one to be rigid, intolerant, even legalistic. And so that particular uh, label, it's not used as much today, but uh, I know when I was a youngster I heard that. One popular label today is evangelical, uh, which uh, you might have uh, trouble defining, uh, but it simply means it's centered on the Gospels. And uh, if you will, the saving power of Jesus as the messenger who brought that good news, which we call the Gospel. Uh, the word uh, is found, you know, it, it sort of comes together from Latin and Greek and other sources, but it means uh, the uh, good news, uh, just as uh, the word angelos you might be familiar with from Revelation, the messenger, uh, means uh, the one who brings the good news, who is Jesus. So evangelical uh, should connote, and uh, hopefully we are evangelical, uh, a commitment to the good news, which springs from the Gospels, uh, the record of Jesus' life, and what he taught. When you have a label, it sort of helps you define and clarify uh, what you think you are, what you should feel, how you should act. But of course, uh, labels can also be misleading. Uh, the evangelical movement, uh, depending on how you, uh, what branch of it you might see, uh, is quite politicized today. And of course, the last few years, everything has been very strained and very, uh, you know, yes, no, right, wrong, left, right, terms like that, uh, forcing people to choose. As I uh, flip between the three networks I view, and I like to view Fox and MSNBC and CNN, uh, because that way I'm going to sort of see a collection of views and people being interviewed. I also like BNN and, uh, I, believe it or not, I like CTV and CBC because you know, they aren't quite as American, uh, but uh, I, I like those. Uh, I see uh, from the last election, the last six or eight years, uh, U U.S. evangelicals have associated themselves very strongly with one side of the spectrum. As I view different channels, I don't know about your experience, I don't find a lot of difference between the news. That is to say, uh, if you've got a camera that's recording the president getting off of Air Force One, uh, I mean, you know, what, how can you spin that? Uh, you, you can't. As you record what's being said word for word, it's kind of funny in a way because uh, when Donald Trump says, you know, here they are, fake news uh, at the back of the room, and all they're doing is rolling a camera recording him, it's hard to fake that. Where fake news comes in, I suppose, is uh, those dreaded words after the report, uh, no matter what channel it's on, you hear those dreaded words, let's bring in our panel. And the panel comes in and then begins the spin. 
And so depending on which particular network you're on, uh, one network uh, feels a little more liberal than the other. Uh, another uh, network uh, will accuse the uh, network of the first part of being liberal or the, uh, uh, the elitist, and the others will uh, accuse the other party of being uh, in the tank for whoever they're in the tank for, and back and forth it'll go. And so it is the, not the, uh, the honest reporter who said, this just happened, and this is what uh, the uh, spokesman just said, or this is what the president just tweeted, uh, or this is what Mr. Trudeau just did or said. Uh, what happens is when you get the analyst who comes in, as I said, that's why you dread those words, let's bring in our panel. And uh, they begin then to spin and uh, create the narrative or to try to debunk the narrative that perhaps they feel is being presented to them. Um, there's been a lot of uh, pushback, of course, depending on uh, which particular uh, group you may be uh, observing. Um, certainly I've seen some evangelicals who have been extremely agitated and uh, will uh, side with a candidate who perhaps may be a complete and total hypocrite because they feel he will in some way or other roll back uh, access to abortion, let's say. One particular candidate uh, who was running, and that was one of his big planks in his platform, of course had to drop out of the political race because his mistress uh, went ahead and then published his rather uh, abusive uh, texts to her saying uh, you should take care of this pregnancy by getting an abortion. And of course here he was uh, standing before evangelical Christians who were prepared to throw their support behind him uh, and appealing to them to get elected uh, on the basis of I will deal with this and I will see laws change then I will advocate for this, that, or the other thing. Uh, other issues, and uh, you can understand why some people are extremely sensitive about it. Uh, certainly uh, you have the lunacy of the ex one extreme anyway on immigration. Uh, apparently there are those who believe that you should just sort of collapse the borders and let everybody into the United States. I don't hope, hope there are not too many of those. But I have friends who live in Southern California who are attracted emotionally uh, to uh, one spectrum of candidates because they find themselves living now in an area where uh, there's a lot of stress and strain uh, because of massive illegal immigration. And so as I, I listened to them, uh, and I didn't understand this before, I was a, a legal immigrant to the United States and lived there for some years, uh, but they explain that uh, now anybody can get a driver's license because it's better for insurance purposes, it's better for this, that, and the other thing. But if you have a license, then you can go ahead and vote. And of course, you're supposed to be a citizen before you vote. I know for many years, people ask me, who did you vote for in this federal or provincial election? And I would answer, I, I can't vote. I'm not a citizen of Canada. And uh, I always traveled on my European passport. Uh, but uh, many years ago now I went and I became a citizen of Canada and uh, now I travel on a blue passport uh, except when I get to England then I just go through the other line with a red passport and they just take a quick picture of my face and I'm in and family and friends stand in the other line and grit their teeth. But uh, I, I am a fully fledged, uh, I was a legal immigrant to Canada, it was kind of touch and go. Uh, I. Th I you know, I, I don't know if you ever told you the story, but when I came into Canada at first, I came as a visitor and I was told just go back and uh, come up to the border uh, tomorrow and get your passport stamped. And so I came up to the border and they looked at me and they said, we can't let you in. And I was flabbergasted. And I said, well, well, I didn't say this out loud, but I'm thinking, all my clothes are in Burnaby. I've rented this little bachelor suite. I have a bank account. I am employed in Canada and you see I can't come in. I said, well, okay, how long is it going to take? And they said, well, you need to apply through Ottawa. I said, well, how long will that take? They said, six months. Huh? Okay, so I backed out peacefully without stirring anything up and I went over to Blaine, which was the other crossing where commercial trucks traveled through and I said, hi, just visiting Canada. Drove in and then I went and told my uh, boss, uh, Mr. Wilson, 
I'm in deep trouble here. I, apparently, I can't come in. Hey, don't worry. Just, just go down to Bellingham, stay there, and we'll have responsibilities and work will assign you. And so I lived in Bellingham for a couple of weeks, and every day I came to the border. Uh, or I phoned, and nobody would touch me. And one day I came to the border, and in my prayers were answered. I met a man who thought it through a little bit, and he said, well, we could have kind of let you in on a temporary visa. He said, uh, and uh, he used the term a ministerial permit. By that, he meant uh, the Minister of Immigration. And he said, this is the sort of permit that we use for journalists and circus performers. Welcome to Canada. <laughs> and literally on that basis, I came in because I thought, they thought I was a little bit of a clown. And after that, I married a Canadian. And after that, there was an amnesty. And after that, I got a pink piece of paper. And I was told, never lose this pink piece of paper. To this day, I have a photocopy of it, uh, just in case anything is challenged. But uh, uh, I, I had that stapled in my European passport for years. And every time I came, they look at me, and, oh, OK, OK. And they would give me the twice over. And uh, my wife and kids, they'd come in because they were legal Canadian citizens and I'd be held up for a few moments as they double checked me. So I understand a little bit about immigration and of course being involved with folks coming to Canada uh, from uh, Africa especially. I'm very aware that there are lots of rules and regulations. So if I, if I was living in Southern California and I heard about the illegal immigration and I witnessed it and I saw the stress on schools and I was, I, again, my own friends who live in Southern California, I asked, uh, what do you do for health insurance? And uh, one of them said, I, my, I'm partly covered by my wife. Uh, well, okay, uh, so you have to get some supplemental? He said, yeah, I have to get some supplemental health insurance. It cost me $1,200 a month. <gasps> oh, wow, that, that, you could buy a house for $1,200 a month. I know Ross Judson, who was here a while ago, I asked him, well, what do you, you and Tammy do? And he said, oh, we, we, we pay about, uh, it's only $800 a month. But the deductible is $10,000. So in other words, if you have, you, you know, you need a wart taken off or you need something, you, you say, you pay the first $10,000? And having gone through, you know, uh, critical illness with my family and uh, myself, I've been in an emergency a couple of times in the last few years, um, you know, that's incredible to me. Uh, and so you could understand the political sensitivities as people are running for office and perhaps uh, making uh, uh, payment, uh, uh, you know, claims. And uh, I, I was talking again to one of my friends from Southern California, I won't name him, but uh, he's kind of, you know, he, he's kind of a little bit he said it was, he was hoping for better things under this president, and he feels doing better. Of course, the economy is doing better than under the last president. And uh, he, uh, he talked about, but I just wish he wouldn't tweet so much. And then he expressed her frustration of, with the last administration. But after a few moments, he said, ah, I get so frustrated. They all lie. They all lie which you might say is an over-the-top exaggeration, but actually, you know, if you uh, include gross exaggerations, yeah, you know, it's kind of kind of tough to not conclude. I know, as I listened to the last president say, you know, our, 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 our annual deficits are coming way, way, way down, and this is so good. And at the back of my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, but the Debt, the accumulated debt for the United States has is, is, is almost doubled in the last eight years. That can't be good. That cannot be good. Sooner or later, the kids or the grandkids are going to have to pay this in some way. And so choosing to neglect certain things, you know, there are lies of omission, you know, just as uh, somebody might protest if you elect me, well, you'll have much better health insurance. You'll have much better health insurance, and the <coughs> premiums will be a fraction of what you pay now. How can you pull that off? But of course, nobody's been able to pull that off. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, I, I look at this latest controversy. Um, you know, the president has the authority to pull um, clearances, and you'd think that he'd absolutely uh, tarred and feathered some guy because, no, nope, we're not gonna give you a security clearance any longer. Uh, now, being a Canadian, I can judge this from afar. And 
I thought, well, you know, like, okay, I guess there's something to it. But you know something, about a million people, I understand now, have security clearances. And it, all it means is if the president or any uh, current member of the administration wants to talk to this individual, well, you, had a, sir, you have an ongoing security clearance. I can talk to you about this very sensitive matter. It doesn't mean to say they get a daily briefing. It doesn't mean to say they have access to things. So one side says, you know, um, uh, why should this person have a security clearance? Uh, and it makes it sound as though they have something extremely special and they have a special pipeline in to, to confidential information. No, they don't. They know as much as anybody else. But if ever called upon to comment on something they knew about or experienced 10, 15, five years ago, they can do so freely and they can be privileged and sort of read in on something else. Uh, the other side yells and screams and says, well, you're abridging this person's constitutional rights, abridging freedom of speech. No, I can't say that. I just saw the guy on television saying, I really don't like what just happened. You pull my security clearance. Well, you're free to say anything you like. It's just that you can no longer say, well, I have, I have security clearance because the individuals who administer that take, took it away. So, you know, it depends on who's spinning it one way or spinning it the other. And when you finally get down and say, well, what does this really mean? And maybe if you're lucky, you'll find one person when they bring in the panel to actually explain it and say, this is what it means. That's why I like guys like uh, Judge Napolitano because he just gives a simple, direct, this is what the law says. And this is what the possibility are. That, that's why I like Alan Dershowitz, uh, because he's a professor of law, and uh, he said, well, these are things are political, but this is the law, and this is where it's heading because of these things. So anyway, that's just my personal opinion, which I'm sure all of you will be swayed by. Oh, okay, I forgot you're all Albertans. <laughs> you don't care what I think. <laughs> But this is the world that we live in. Uh, this is the soup that we swim in. And it's morality, it's ethics, it's stupidity influences and affects us all. And uh, as, as I look at that and as I think about that, and as I, you know, as I said, I dial between channels and try to figure out, okay, what's really happening? Okay, you're saying this, you're saying this, you're, oh, hey, Here's a clear analysis from a lawyer who hopefully is above all of this and is, you know, a judge who's above all of this uh, and, and, and pretends to be, you know, he's not advocating for anything. He's just saying, this is what the law says and this is the fa these are the facts. When it comes to relating to this crazy ongoing society, um, I, uh, I, I'm drawn back to, to Paul's world because the advice he gives or the direction he gives is still very, very relevant. As an evangelical Christian, one who believes in the good news of the gospel message, how do I exist in this polarized world that wants to drag me one way or drag me the other way? Get me to support one individual and curse the other one. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 9, Paul is dealing with uh, a problem. Uh, the presenting problem is an individual who is in, conducting himself in an immoral way. And this is acceptable to the world in which he lives, apparently, uh, or at least tolerable. But he explains that, look, there are, this is something that should be addressed from a Christian perspective. And then he goes ahead and talks about it. Now, remember, Paul is writing to Corinth, and he used to live in Corinth. And when he lived in Corinth, he was very aware of the fact that uh, Corinth was, uh, well, it depends on who you listen to, okay? Uh, the, the, uh, the verb to Corinthianize, um, I've heard it explained by an English uh, professor uh, who said that to Corinthianize simply means to prostitute oneself. Or, a Greek scholar once explained, if you consider this, you will learn that uh, to Corinthianize means to live well. And I tried to understand that. And I think it came to some extent from the, uh, we might use the expression today, 
what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. You know that idea? That here is a place where you go and you live it up. Uh, but you know, you push the boundaries, there, there are no real restraints. Uh, Nevada's known for that, Las Vegas is known for that. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And so you might say to Corinthianize, okay, on the one hand you could say it's like, well, it's that type of world. Uh, on the other hand, you could say what it means to prostitute oneself. Uh, somewhere in that spectrum, you know, you try to understand what it meant to be living in Corinth. There's a temple up on the hill uh, that was staffed by hundreds and hundreds, in fact, about a thousand temple prostitutes. And the prevailing Greek view, uh, if you will, was what happened in the body was of no consequence to the spirit, the real you. Which is why you will read things uh, coming from Paul uh, like um, body, soul, and spirit. In other words, the, the entire individual. Uh, which is why you will read things in 1 Corinthians about the future for a Christian is to have the mortal change to immortality. In other words, your body will be transformed and glorified, uh, which was not something Greeks naturally looked for. Uh, they thought if you could be liberated from the body, then you really had achieved something. And so you understand that, that here we are talking to a group of people who live in a society, in a city that, whose name means at the very least to not have any real restraints upon you. And remember, it's a port city. And port cities are kind of famous for, you know, whatever. Uh, everything goes in a port city. And so Paul actually had moved from Athens and settled in Corinth so that he could very specifically influence the people who traveled through. And of course, if you infect, in quotes, one person with a Christian message and they travel on to another location, it's kind of a mini Pentecost experience. Uh, the Jews in Jerusalem were, quote, infected by the good news of the gospel. They went back around the world and they in turn shared that in their synagogues. So with that little bit of background, Paul now writing to the, the church at Corinth said, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave this world. Oh, okay. So you are recognizing that the world is a place that is, well, not exactly God's world. And in fact, uh, in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 3, where Paul is introducing himself, if you will, to the churches that he writes to, he says to them, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins, what? To rescue us from the present evil age. Uh, that word uh, age, uh, you know, is translated in the King James world, aeon. Uh, the, 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 this, this present evil setup, if you will. Uh, a world in which everybody is, uh, okay, there are many good things that happen in this world. Let's not get too negative here. But it is a world that results from the action of doing what? Taking from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It doesn't mean to say everything everybody does is just absolutely rotten and no, no redeeming quality at all. It's saying that the world is a hodgepodge, a mix of good and evil, and which we understand there is an adversary uh, who likes to cater to and mislead and get us to go towards the evil. And so he describes this as not exactly God's world, but rather a world we need to be rescued from. According, that's the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Oh, okay. So, all right, we find ourselves in a world that is dominated by the idea that there is really, and I've got to be careful about this, I'm not a philosophy major, and there are like dozens and dozens of schools of philosophy, and you can hang labels on them in all directions. Um, 
you know, same. I mean, there are dozens and dozens of schools of uh, disciplines of psychology. Uh, I made the mistake recently of referring, you know, just talking about the experience of falling in love and what it did to the, uh, 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 the, the brain. And I, and I used the term, uh, you know, the enzymes get busy up there and alter your, your chemical balance in the brain, uh, which is kind of, uh, kind of okay, but somebody who actually studies biology says, uh, actually technically it's the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the synapse of the brain that are affected. That's what's happening there. Same result, but you were totally wrong in the way you described it. I said, well, I'm praying that there are not too many biologists in the congregation. Because, uh, okay, so now I'm praying that not too many philosophy majors in the congregation. But I do know that, uh, let's say this is a world uh, where, uh, uh, let's say, the, the discipline of uh, existentialism might prevail, uh, which would purport that uh, you work out your existence, okay, without the assumption that there are actually clear standards of right or wrong. You figure that out for yourself as you exist. Uh, you know, hence uh, one little buzzword, one definition I heard was, I am what I do. I am what I do. Whereas a Christian views this world as I am God's creation. There is a higher authority. There is a higher purpose to my life. A Christian begins by saying, I am created for the purpose of knowing and relating to my creator. And this sort of comes through, some people begin to grasp for this. I, I saw an interview once with uh, Tim Allen, you know, uh, Home Improvement, the comedian. Uh, he'd gone through a lot of ups and downs in his life. And he said, I, I th he said, one thing I'd like to do is meet the creator, the one who made me, and understand what it is I'm made for. And a Christian says that God made me and I'm made to come to understand him, to live as he asked me to live, to function as he asked me to function. Relating that back to the world then, I'm gonna just summarize this uh, a little bit, uh, put my thoughts down. It said, this is not God's world, Paul just told us. This is not God's world or age. And in the same way, the church is not going to change this world. Now, we can, quote, change the world, unquote. Uh, by that, I mean we can influence, we can change the world beginning with the man in the mirror, with me. You know, some time ago, I ran across uh, an interesting uh, uh, sort of story, uh, uh, a fellow by the name of the Admiral, Admiral William McRaven, who's the uh, graduate of the University of Texas. And they invited him back now as a, uh, a very uh, dignified individual, a very uh, uh, well-respected military leader. And he talked about graduating from the University of Texas and being, he couldn't remember what the, uh, the uh, graduating uh, speaker uh, had, uh, had to say. But he said, uh, you all wanna change the world. He said, I'm gonna tell you how to change the world. When you get up in the morning, make your bed. That's where, that's where he started. And he talked about the influence that the, you could have one-on-one -on -one with someone else. And he talked about his experience and how he learned that was through becoming a Navy SEAL. You know, uh, the day that he uh, graduated, he said he was commissioned as a, a military officer and he went off for SEAL training. Uh, and all of the lessons he learned from that. But he began by, uh, simply put, get up, make your bed. And even if the, everything else fails that day, at least you'll come home to a comfortable bed in the hope that tomorrow you can start again. And you'll know that you've done something right at the start of the day. And it's very much that way for you and me. We can change the world, but we are not going to change the cosmos. We are not going to change the universe. We're going to, we can only, in response to God's work in our lives, the Holy Spirit, be changed. And we can also reconcile ourselves to the church is not the kingdom of God. The church is not perfect. It never will be. On the other hand, we live in hopes because the church is where it begins. It begins as the words of Jesus, the kingdom of God is among you. It's within you. 
It is in your mind, it's in your emotions, it's in your heart. It is among us. It is beginning. But we are not going to transform this world. And it would be a mistake for the church to think that if we could just get behind the right candidate, then we could bring about the kingdom of God. And then the, that really speaks to me. Some of these themes were suggested to me what, uh, by uh, Dr. Uh, Gary Detto was uh, trying to address because, uh, you know, when it comes back down to it, I'm responsible for what? My own backyard. Um, I'm and which has got to be cleaned up before Wednesday because all the seniors are coming for lunch. Uh, I'm responsible for my own little space, some of which is in presently in chaos because I still haven't sort of established a, a, a real clean working area. I'm responsible for my own mind, my own body. And these things God has given me a lot of control over. On the other hand, I have not control over this world. Paul explains this when he says, but now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister. In other words, don't hang out and pretend that you share faith with and share your heart with and share the Holy Spirit with someone who is showing themselves to be sexually immoral, greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or swindler. He goes on to say, do not even eat with such people. Now, that might sound very ominous, but uh, in the culture that Paul was addressing, if you sat down and you ate with someone, that was an important gesture. It meant you were friends. You shared, in fact, covenant. It wasn't just, hey, got a few minutes, let's uh, split the sandwich. It meant you sat down and you bonded. You affirmed your relationship. So, uh, just, you know, stopping for lunch after church doesn't mean to say you've got to examine somebody. Hey, Gene, let's have coffee together. How are you living these days? You know, you don't, I mean, it's crazy. But what he's saying is when somebody is uh, obviously showing themselves not to share the faith, well, sooner or later you've got to not hang out with them. Paul, in another context, will say, uh, evil company corrupts you, things like that. But he goes on to say, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Uh, that is why I do not align myself in one way or the other to scream and yell at any particular party, any particular ethnic group, any particular uh, political group. Uh, you know, I, I am not the judge and jury of this world. On the other hand, I am the judge and jury of my own environment and the people I choose to share the Holy Spirit with. I've got to perceive that they have the Holy Spirit. I don't go and ask advice from somebody uh, who is uh, not on the same spiritual wavelength. Now, it says God will judge those outside. So, uh, as I look at certain things, and again, the spin is always there, isn't it? Uh, there are those who will point and say, you know, these people are multimillionaires. They come from nothing. How do they make so much money? And now that they have influence and political influence, they have a foundation. And, you know, you can't get near them unless you donate to their foundation. And that foundation, in turn, enriches them. Wow, 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 wow. On it goes. And then, of course, the other side, well, look, this individual is a billionaire. Uh, you know, he always hangs out at places he owns and uh, anybody who wants to see him, uh, they, they, they're going to hang out at hotels that he owns and uh, all these places have upped their rates by 100% and, you know, you have all this talk of the emoluments clause and everything else. Hey, it's all, quote, legal, unquote. So how can I be drawn into a big argument about that? You know, I hear about all the Russian money that comes in to finance uh, buildings and how all these nasty people like to pour their money in. Hey, as long as it's legal, oh, not a lot really you can criticize. Now, if you don't like it, then go to Congress and ask to change the law. In the same way, if these po folks don't pass their tax audit, you know, we, I, we, we commented a while ago, we, we have a board of, uh, uh, of uh, trustees for the church in Canada. 
And one of the major responsibilities is literally financial oversight. If they find anything that's wrong anywhere, then they come and arrest Jerry Sinclair, the chairman, and then we send him a cake with a file in it and hope in the best, you know. But literally, somebody somewhere is responsible. And I'm really glad it's Jerry and not me. He has to answer for absolutely everybody, okay? But, uh, you know, we do have a clean record and we are within the law and we do everything precisely. And so sometimes people, the only problem with Paul Manafort, he had lots and lots of money, but he told the IRS, uh, apparently, uh, it was a loan. Turned out to be money that he sort of was hanging on to. It wasn't a loan, it was really his. And he didn't, it didn't declare it that way and didn't pay taxes on it. So they're having a big discussion as to whether or not he goes to jail or not. But as you look at it, you say, well, man, you know, you're criticizing him for this. He's criticizing you for the same thing. As my friend from California says, they're all liars. Okay? Or as Shakespeare said, simply a pox on both your houses. You know, this is great. But hey, listen, I am not responsible and I do not have the authority to, I may be frustrated by it, but I do not judge those outside the church. But I do judge myself and I must, if you will, hang out with people who are of the same spiritual conviction. Well, I think uh, as I look, as I see, I, uh, uh, let's just summarize it this way. I, at the end of the day, I can't align myself with any really uh, totally godly political position. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, for years I was not a citizen, so the easiest answer I could give when people say, who'd you vote for? I was able to say, uh, <clears throat> I, c I can't vote, I'm not a citizen. But then actually, uh, when I became a citizen, they say, uh, who do you vote for? Well, okay, that's kind of a private matter, but I will say this. Um, I have uh, prayed for both the Trudeaus, father and son. I've also prayed about both the Trudeaus, <laughs> father and son. And these days I kind of wish that Mr. Trudeau has more strength to his elbow so that as an Albertan, there's a pipeline. If we're going to use oil for the next 50 years, and it seems they're going to, because not everybody's going electric tomorrow. And if we're going to be having a world that uses some oil, well, I kind of like there to be a pipeline. My granddaughter lives in BC. Well, she did up until yesterday. She just flew to Poland yesterday. So she's living in Poland for a year. When she comes back, we'll see how much she appreciates Canada. But anyway, my little granddaughter and I say, so I'm an Albertan, Zara. What do you think of Alberta? Well, and then comes the spin that she's learned. All right. And so we have this nice, quiet family debate on why pipelines are not the most evil thing in the world. And that is a political matter. So uh, you say, do you pray for those who have sway because you recognize that God allows people to be appointed? And the answer is yes. But do I hold myself in a different world? Absolutely. And do I hope for a better one? You bet I do. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you today that we can enjoy the freedom and liberty as Canadians. And we can enjoy all sorts of privileges because you allow us to live in a Pretty wonderful country. On the other hand, uh, we also uh, watch the news. There's turmoil, there's conflict, people yelling at each other. Uh, even some of those major problems in the uh, United States with immigration and all sorts of other stresses, we're starting to feel those in so, to some extent in Canada as well. And so we ask as uh, your church that we could simply be the beacon of light that you ask us to be, that our own uh, determination should be that we be transformed. Uh, through learning to love you as our God, and also in this world, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so we thank you for your blessings, your protection, your privilege, and we do ask that you'd uh, journey with us this coming week, and that we be the light that you intend us to be. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.